Good masters, sweet ladies, I am Mrs. Montano, the third grade teacher. <laughs> the third grade class of River Tree School will present a wonderful collection of short plays. These plays are monologues. A monologue is a one-person play, if you will. They come from a book called Good Master, Sweet Ladies, Voices from a Medieval Village. They were written by a, libra a, a librarian and by the name of Laura Amy Schultz. These monologues are set in the Middle Ages, that is, before Shakespeare's time, in around the mid-1250s in an English village. Each actor will have the chance to tell their own story, what their life was like living in an English village in the Middle Ages. The plays stand on their own, although you'll see that there's a sense of interconnectedness for all of the, all the actors, all the people in the village, they live pretty close to one another. They live in a, in a village where they range, the children range from ages 10 to 15. And you'll, have, you'll see that some of them are poor and some of them are rich. Some of them are out in the world making their own way. Some of them are working. Some of them are learning a trade. Some are helping their families. Some are wanting to get married. And some have never known a want. So here we invite you to step back into this village, into the Middle Ages, where the life plays out through our characters. Enjoy the experience. Thank you. Good masters, sweet ladies, I'm Hugo, the Lord's nephew. The feast of all souls, I ran for my tutor. Latin and grammar, no wonder. I ran to the woods where I saw his tracks, this big, in the mud he scratched, bottom side the tre trees. Followed his fry aunt straight to his bed and found it warm. There's a boar in the forest. When I got back, there was my uncle, rod and hand, but he didn't strike. I told them that there's a boar in the forest. Why then, we'll go hunting. And as for you, you'll hunt like a man or be flogged like a boy. Help kill the boar and I'll give you the kidneys. Turn tail and I'll have the skin off your back. That night, I lay and dreamed of the hunt, the underbrush stirring, the snort of the boar, its foul mouth foaming, its tusks like scimitars. Those tusks can slice a man, but that's not the worst. The man that dies from the wound of a boar loses his soul. Dawn came. We mounted. Long before noon, the dogs cut the scent, and the hunt was on. Two relays of hounds, squealing most sore. The third was faint with fatigue. I could smell my sweat, rank with fear. And then it was like my dream. The underbrush moved. The stick shattered. I saw it, bristling, dark as the devil, huge as a horse. My uncle dismounted, and I did the same. My legs were like straw, but I walked. Mouth dry, palms wet, one hand forward on the spear, and one foot ahead. To fall would be death. It charged. My uncle lunged, and I behind him thrust, felt the spear pierce, braced myself, end to armpit shoved. It took a long time. The dogs keening and the boar struggling, blood in the grass, but I stood my ground. At last it was over, and the brute lay still. I almost wept, the joy of it, and the terror. I gasped like a fish, let my head fall back. The green leaves swam in the sky. He kept his word right there in the wood. We kindled a fire and butchered a boar. The kidneys were mine, gleaming with fat. He clapped my back and called me a man. But dark of the night, I hear that sound. Sweat in my sleep, my spear slips through my hands, and I dream that I'm back in the woods with that boar.
Good masters, sweet ladies, I'm Taggett, the blacksmith's daughter. Nine days it's been since the Maying. I'm restless yet. Mother hasn't seen it, nor father, nor Robin. Only the horses know. It was May Day. All the others, even mother and father at their age, set off for the woods. Wanting bluebells and cowlips and kissing under the trees, I used to go when I was little. I liked big flowers and peak. But I'm older now. All my friends have sweethearts. There's no one for me. I know why. I'm too tall, father says. His father was a giant of man, and somehow his size came down to me. I'll likely not marry at all. It's a world of trouble. You'll save yourself, says mother. Child bearing and child dying, and no doubt she's right. I always weep when the hogs are slaughtered. I'm not strong enough to bear and lose. My fine girl, that's father. He taught me how to work in the forage, and even Robert admits there's no one better to quiet the horses. I lay my hands on them. I feel them trembling. I know how they feel. They're like me, timid. So I breathe sweet peace to them, not with my fingers, not with my lips, but through my fingers. And they hear me, not with their ears, but through their skins. All the others went to Maying. I stayed behind, spinning in the sunshine. I was as happy as a singing bird. And then he came, leading his horse and horse, limping, head down, head down, as fine a horse I've ever seen, a fair gray palfrey, a wondrous horse. But I was gazing at the boy. He had brown hair, not golden like a knight's in his story. His eyes, dark as rivers. He wore a blue cloak, bluer than the sky, and in the clasp, a spring of hawthorn. He'd been a maying, and how I disliked her, the girl he might have kissed. I was ashamed to be caught staring, but I put my hands on the palfrey. He gentled, as they always do. I ran my hand on the lame leg, picked up the hoof, and saw stone cut between the hoof and the shoe. A grievous thing. Is the blacksmith in? His voice was like his face, proud and courteous. My palms were sweating. I can ease him. So I led the horse to the forge. The master followed. I could tell right away he loved his horse. I don't know what he thought that a mate should know how to shoe a horse. He may have been startled. I daren't look. I set to work. My hands were steady. All the time I was fishing for something to say. A fine morning, or even, what's your name? But I knew who he was. Hugo, they called him. I never did speak, for I thought if I opened my mouth, he'd know my whole heart. When I was finished, I wiped my hands on my apron. He held out a coin, a farthing. I was sudden bold. I reached out my hand and shoved it away. And then touching him was what did it. My face got hot. I could almost hear Robin saying, Taggett's blushing. Look it. Taggett. Taggett's red. I turned and ran back to the house, crouched down with my back to the door, hid my face in my hands. I don't know why or for how long. And then afterwards, I went back to the forge. By then, he was gone, long gone. It seems a long life. I might live 50 years and never see him again. Thinking that, I bent my head and saw, lying on the anvil, a miracle, that spring of hawthorn from his cloak. If it were on the ground, it might have fallen, but it was on the anvil. I picked it up as if for a holy. I couldn't stop smiling. He'd left it for me. Good masters, sweet ladies, I'm Isabel, the Lord's daughter. I cannot get this stain out of my gown. I've tried chicken feathers, water, and ox gout, and still this mark. My father will be angry, a fine silk gown spoiled, but it's not my fault. I passed through the town on my way to the market, and then someone threw it, a clod of dung. I saw the boys, but didn't know which. I was walking eyes down as a modest maid should. And then it hit me. I looked up and saw them, sniggering, hiding their smiles in their dirty hands. If I told my father, he would see that they all had a good beating, and maybe I should. Only one through the clod, only one should be beaten. But which? I cannot take the stain from my gown, nor the thought from my mind. They hate me. Why? What have I done? With my own soft hands, I give bread out on Mama's day. From my own purse, I give to the poor. And in times of war, those selfsame boys would scurry like rats 
to hide themselves in my father's walls. Yes, it is true, I am better clad and better shod and better fed than those churls. And what if I am? The Lord God chose my father to rule the same way he chose them to serve. I do but take what they would take if the Lord God chose to give to them. I want to forget the way they laughed. Their smiles were so ugly, I almost feared. They were big boys, almost men, and I was alone except for my maidservant, Emmett. Never mind, lady, she says to me, but I do mind. My gown is spoilt, and never again shall I walk through the streets with my eyes cast down. Good master, sweet ladies, I'm Alice the Shepherdess. My mother died and I was born, so I was suckled by one of the sheep. It's made me, my father says, more sheep than human, which is true. All my life, I've lived with the sheep, drunk their milk, eaten their meat, washed their fleece, carded their wool, and now that I'm older, I help with the lambing. My hands are small, which is good if you have to reach inside a sheep. Jilly's my favorite. She's my sister. The same mother gave us milk. Most sheep don't care one way or another, but Jilly's sweet of heart. I love the feel of her chin and the palm of my hand. I love the smell of her on my fingers. It was last spring that I awakened and I knew something was wrong. Jilly, what's amiss? And she only stared at the blank, dark eyes of a beast in pain. I walked behind her, lifted her tail, and saw the head of a dead lamb sticking out between her legs. She's been struggling to push out that lamb heaven knows how long, and me lying asleep. I rubbed goose grease on my hands and reached inside. She was bone dry. I knew I hurt her dragging out that lamb, and she lay on the grass, motionless as death. I called the old shepherd, and he said she would die. She's given up, he said. Sheep don't fight. That's why they need shepherds. I started to cry, and old Ralph saw there's one thing he said. I wiped my nose on my sleeve. What's that? You may try singing. No one knows why, but sheep fancy music they do. So all that day and all that night, I stayed by Jill and sang. God restore thee, thou heavenly sheep. Hark to my music and heal in thy sleep. It was really a song for the Virgin Mary, but I changed the words. I sang it over and over till the stars came out. Do not forsake me, my sister, my sheep. Slumber ye gently and heal in thy sleep. I stroked her fleece and felt her chest a hundred times to see if she was breathing. The moon crossed the sky and the stars came out and I sang. Best of all the flock that I tend, my lamb, my jelly, my sister, my friend. My lambkin and jelly, thou heavenly sheep, lullaby lily, and heal in thy sleep. I sang it over and over till my voice was hoarse, and I was shivering so hard I couldn't go on. Then I wrapped my arms around Jill, lay down by her side, and slept. I must have slept well because she got away from me. I opened my eyes, the sky was full of red, and Jill was standing up, cropping her grass. Good masters, sweet ladies, I'm Pierce, the glassblower's apprentice. After three years of pumping the bellows and stroking the furnace, I said to my master, when am I going to learn how to blow glass? And he stared at me with his one blue eye. The other was burnt in a workshop fire. There's a red seam down his face where the eye melted shut. I once was afraid of him, not now. When I choose to teach you, that's all he said. For the rest of the week, I was peevish and slothful. He knew I was rough. And once he said, you ain't find it easy. It's harder than it looks. And then he said, now. And I blinked. What now? You wanted a chance to blow glass. Now try it. So I did. I'd watched him a thousand times. I took the iron pipe and held it in the fire until it glowed red hot. But my hand, my left hand, nearest the fire, throbbed with heat. I could feel the sweat run down my chest. I gathered the glass, white hot glowing, and put the pipe 
in my mouth and blew and blew, but it did not work. The glass was stiff and it would not swell. I put my thumb on the mouth of the pipe, sucked air, blew out, and all this while the glass was getting colder, duller, orange, blood red, mud red, black. I didn't dare look at him, that one-eyed stare, but his voice was kind, again. I took the pipe, gathered the glass, sweated blue, my cheeks puffed out, the iron pipe banged my teeth. I blew like the angel Gabriel, sounding the horn for judgment day. I felt the bubbles start to form. I trapped the air, rolled the glass, and twirled it on the marble slam. And now my right hand burned and ached, and the glass was off, lopsided. I didn't dare lift my head. The glass was ruined, but he said, well done. St. Luke, please help me to try again and keep my master well. Amen. Good masters, sweet ladies, I am Laudie the varlet's child. Father is a varlet, and the varlet serves the Lord. He feeds and tends the master's hounds, and takes a fairy reward. I've helped clean the kennels, held the puppies on my knees. I love the dogs, but my bones, the house is full of fleas. Fleas in the porridge bowls, fleas in the bread, blood-sucking fleas in the blankets of our beds, nibbling our buttocks and the backs of our knees, biting and delighting through the night, those fleas. My mother died when I was born. The house is mine to keep. It's my fault if 10,000 fleas bite us when we sleep. I've used bird lime and turpentine, enough to make you choo, sneeze. All the leaves and lavender, we've still got fleas. Fleas with good appetites, some are salting high. Fleas leading chases, running races up my thigh. Fleas leaping hurdles, they're as strong as Hercules. The master raises hunting dogs, and we raise fleas. I'm proud of my father as he cares for the dogs and brash. He brings food for the table and done for the thatch. Even when the winter's bad, another starving freeze. We've poured from the kennels, and we've also got those fleas. I'm used to the lice raising families in my hair. I expect moths to nibble holes in everything I wear. I scrape away the maggots when they curl across the cheese. I can get used to anything except for the fleas. Fleas between my fingertips, ready to get squashed. Fleas floating dead in the water where I wash. I act in the cathedral when I pray upon my knees. Lord, you save us from Hades. Now save us from the fleas. Masters, sweet ladies, I am jealous the beggar, the best of my trade. Behold, my crushed foot, the sharp wound, with sick in your stomach and sharpened heart. A penny, a farthing, a growl of her mercy. Sometimes a man's real tears. It's an art. No takers, no givers, not even a morsel? Ah, they are stoned to my pitiful cries. So I'm left to my wits, which are in fact prodigiously keen and surpassingly wise. Enter town with my crutch and my cry. Food from the famished, on the poor. I stagger, collapse in the dust of the road. I swoon, two glasses go one step more. And here comes my father, but I do not know him. My father, the peddler, the dealer in relics. Ten pence for a thread from St. Margaret's Vale. Who covers the thumbnail of Martin of Tours? Or this, better still, even this can be yours. Flask of the sacred holy water. Stand back now, don't push, don't jostle. Flask of the sacred holy water. Use on the feet of St. James, apostle. Sometimes they pay, more often they don't. So he throws up his hands and sighs, like that. Oh, ye of no faith, before you, I swear, I will hear here now this unfortunate brat. That's my cue, so I whimper. He opens the flask, anoints me, while I seem to faint. I 
swoon in his arms. Look upward, cry out. See how the peasants step forward and gawk? Angels, apostles, I see them before me. I throw down my clutch, clasp my hands, and I walk. My father and I rehearse the showers. Miracles have to look perfectly natural. He walks, praise God and his saints. He walks. If I do this just right, the crowd gasps aloud. They genuflect, weep, stretch out their hands and touch. And while they are paying for drops of that water, I gather up my bandages, pick up my crutch, my pantomime done. once the money is paid. I creep out of town. I feel guilt, but not much. Later, my father follows the high road. We meet. He gives me my supper, my pay. Bread and an apple, cabbages, turnips, sometimes there's sausages, and a good day. We stop by the road, ask our Lord to look after us, send us more fools for our food and our keep, forgive us our trespasses, pardon our lies, look after your foxes as well as your sheep. or suffer from green-eyed jealousy. If you have played fast and loose. If you have been tongue-tied. A tower of strength. Hoodwinked. Or in a pickle. If you have knitted your brows. Made a virtue of necessity. Insisted on fair play. Slept not one wink. Stood on ceremony. Danced attendance on your lord and master. Laughed yourself into stitches. Had short shrift. Called comfort. Or too much of a good thing. If you have seen better days. Or lived in a fool's paradise. What? Then, be that as you may, the more fool you. For it is a foregone conclusion that you are, as good luck would have it, quoting Shakespeare. If you think it is early days and clear up bag and baggage. If you think it is high time, as that is the long and short of it. If you think that the game is up and that truth will out even if it involves your own flesh and blood. If you lie low to the crack of doom because you suspect foul play. If, if you have your teeth set on edge at one foul swoop without rhyme or reason, then. To give the devil his due. If the truth were known for surely you have a tongue in your head. You, you are, are quoting Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Even if, if you, you bid me good riddance and send me packing. If, if you, you wish I was as dead as a doornail, if, if you, you think, think I'm an eyesore, a laughing stock, the devil incarnate, a stony hearted villain, bloody minded, or a blinking idiot, then. By Jove. Oh Lord, tut tut. For goodness sakes. What the dickens? Let me know, but. It's all one to me. For you are quoting Shakespeare. <laughs> 